it was the right arm of Borrowdale. I mean, the industry, Borrowdale was the industry. In fact, Borrowdale breathed Honister because everybody that was in this valley then was to do with Honister. You know, everybody was religious. Half past seven, the wagon would pass the Borrowdale Hotel, pick its men up on the way, and you could keep your time by it. All the men in clogs, clicking your clock up the road and getting to Honister to start work on the stroke of eight o'clock. Honister was the lifeblood of the valley and anything that happened there was like a whirlwind. It would, it would hit everybody and it was, it, rather than news, that was the news, what was going on at Honister. So if it had a, a good order in, everybody knew Honister had a good order in because the men and women worked there, you know, and it was very important. The Buttermere and Westmoreland Greenslate Company, with a very decaying sign up on top of the horse, was a derelict abandoned site. Why did I buy it? Well, many times I'd flown over it in a helicopter when I was running a helicopter company down in Leeds. On some of the occasions, I used to take my grandfather. He was getting old and he wasn't very well. And on one such occasion, I decided that I would show him all the places by air where he'd worked. And he was short-sighted, and he was hard of hearing, and I would take the helicopter up to 10,000 feet. And he would do these ever slow, decreasing circles, completely going in the wrong direction. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, when we got down to about 800 feet, I would say, boss, I'll take over now, because I want to turn around this cloud or something like this. And I would use the excuse, rather than say he was off course, because he didn't know, know what he was doing. Aye, aye, all right, lad, you get out of it. And, we eventually arrived at Coniston Old Man, and it was a beautiful day. And when we got over Coniston Old Man, and he would peer down through the glass, the perspex of the uh, helicopter. And then finally we arrived at Honister, of which I've passed over many countless times. And I said, there you go, boss. I said, there's Honister. And as he peered down through that glass, and he shook his head and he said, why is it closed? And he never went out, go on, Mark, go on, buy it. He just said, why is it closed? And that was a very poignant moment for me because at the time I looked down and I thought I saw all these roads and, and the industry that had once been there but no longer it ceased. And I thought, why is it closed? So I ran over and I, he said, just get in, get in. <laughs> so I opened the door and without saying anything I jumped in and sat on these boxes. <laughs> and my head was nearly touching the roof. And he just drove off. I said, I said what am I sitting on, Mark? And by now, funnily enough, we were passing the police station, which is just around the corner from where I was. And he said, gunpowder, mother. no, he said explosives, that's what he said, dynamite, that was it. He's sitting on dynamite, mother. What, and, it, what did it feel like sitting on dynamite? I think that's what it was. 
And I said, no, and I nearly wet my pants. And he said, it's all right, mother. It's only dangerous when it gets wet. <laughs> I set one of my colleagues on, my PA, to actually find out who owned it and what it was about. And uh, my PA came back with a big uh, file. And at the end of the, the last page, it was McAlpine's was the owner. The telephone number with the managing director, Chris Law, his name was. Over a several months, I came across the paperwork I'd retained, and it was on Honest Slate Mine. So I wasn't doing anything. Give them a call. And so I did. I gave them a call, and I would, it was unbelievably quick. I was straight through to the managing director, and I said very timidly, really, I said, what are you doing with the little? I was trying to make it small and insignificant. The little slate mine on top of the hill in Borrowdale. And he turned the conversation completely around and said, how's about we have a meeting? Right off the cuff like that. I tried to say, no, we wouldn't have this meeting, but he coerced me around, and sure enough, we had the meeting. And on that meeting, which only lasted 30 minutes of a cafetiere in a hotel foyer in Manchester, we actually shook hands on a deal, and I had no money organised. I hadn't even told my family or friends I was doing this. And... Um, I'd then settled with a deal. The only thing I actually cautioned, and I said subject to, that I could actually work with the stone legally. Going back there, I was enthusiastic. I was 30 year old. I saw a mess, and the mess was so much that I thought, how do I tidy this up as economical as I possibly can, and yet create an industry? The first day that I went up there, and that was in 96, and I'd bought this, all I can explain is, the most awful machine. It was a Thwaites all-drive five-ton dump truck, and that's all I could afford. And it was absolutely goosed when I bought it. And it had a very weak engine, a four-cylinder engine, and it barely could actually pull itself to the top of the hill, never mind put a load on it. So there was no way you could actually take something up the hill, but it would certainly go down the hill. We, we loaded this Thwaites 5 ton all drive right up to the top. As much as you could, I would actually wall it on the top because it took me from the top of the mountain, which was 1,800 feet up, to the Hawes. It would take me an hour to get down. I would get to the first corner. The whole truck tipped onto two wheels going forwards and hit the side of the, the road and then lost half its load on the corner. I kept driving because I couldn't do anything else and I couldn't stop it because I didn't have any brakes. And then it landed on its four wheels and continued down the road. Ten years ago, obviously, I, I'd sat down with the health and safety man and um, I didn't know anything about quarrying and mining. And he said, you must... I'll, I'll tell you this bit because you don't know this bit. He says... I said, I need your help to get this mine operational again. And we sat on these little stools at the Rive on, and I said, um, he said to me, he said, what do you know about quarrying and mining? And I would said, absolutely nothing. I didn't even know what rock looked like, did I? No. So do you? <laughs> do you? Yeah. I said, well, I needed a rock drill, drill steels, up to, say, 13, 14, 15 foot long, but, you know, um, we've got, oh, I've got that, I've got that, I thought, this is smashing, not a problem, eh? So the rock drill I was given was a drift ahead of, a, of an air leg machine, they weigh about 100 weight, and there's no handles or nothing on them, because they fit on the leg. It wasn't the leg, it was just this big lump of metal that you couldn't push, you couldn't do nothing with. You can hardly pick the bloody thing up. I didn't even know what the leg was. And the drill steels I got was a one foot one, I think a seven foot one and a thirteen foot one. But what you need is a one foot one, a two foot, a three foot. You want right through the whole section. Because if you're working off a ladder, you can only work about so far from the rock. You cannot work away back there. So I had to try and drill a hole with this one foot one, which was all right. Then try and get a seven foot one and fix this thing on the back of it off a ladder. Try and push it in. And then the thirteen foot one. Oh, like a trapeze artist. But prior to that, 
You'd shown us what we had to do with the explosives, didn't you? Uh-huh. Make the bags for the, the powder and that. Make them out of paper and grease, you know. It's, it's an old-fashioned way, but it's quite an effective way. And we had now. So he showed us how to get a brush handle, wrap the woman's own magazine around it, lace it with a bit of grease that forms a tube, slide it off the end, close one end off, and pour the gunpowder into the tube. But the easy, we thought. All made cartridges, you know? Right, so you slot it in the drill. So I said, right, we've got that, we understand what we're doing. There was me, Paul, and Clayton, wasn't there? Right. So here we were, three of us, and then poor George was holding this underweight drill, right. weren't you? Right. Sweating, and I'm looking at him. He didn't realise it, but I was in the dark because the torches were on the ground. I think we only had two torches. And there's George, and I'm looking at George, and I'm thinking, what have I done? This looks like hard work. Did you get me? Good job you couldn't lip read. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came to give you a hand, didn't I? And then we were pushing away on this bloody drill and, and pushing it in. And then finally I said to you, I said, George, I said, I said, just stop a minute, let's have a rest. I said, for some reason, didn't I? I said, I can see something over there, but I don't know what it is. Didn't I? <laughs> he says, I've been seeing that as well. It was as though there was something in your eye, and you're rubbing in your eye, thinking, what is over there? Do you know what I mean? You would never think, would you? So he's in the same, but because of the drill and the noise and everything, we didn't, we didn't know, did we? So we stopped the drill and we wandered over. And there was Paul in the dark, wasn't he? And he had a gallon tin of gunpowder and he was pouring, wasn't he? The gunpowder into the tube with a cigarette in his hand. <laughs>
what he had to tell me. And I says, go on then, I'm ready. Ready for the lottery numbers. In my head I was saying this. And my grandfather said one thing. He said, don't sell the mine. Now up until that point, if somebody had come along with £10,000, I would have sold it. And I would have gone to live on a beach somewhere in France or Spain, because I was sick of it. I came back with a, a renewed amount of energy and I thought, right, I'm not going to sell the mine. I thought, how, what can I do? I was out of money completely. I was having to work right through the night and I had been for the previous three years. How could I actually make this right? How could I make it work? But there was one thing that I did have. And that was that I wasn't going to sell the mine anymore, so my mind wasn't being wasted on trying to think how I could sell it, but how I could make it better. Things just seemed to happen a little bit easier. When I bought the mine, yeah. unbeknown to me, right, I never asked for John's advice because we never got on. Yeah. So it was me and his brother Bill that went and bought the mine, and when we bought it, we went up there and I said, right, we'll, we'll start working with the, what, he, what John passes as rubbish on the ground. And a couple of months passed, didn't it? Uh, and then John, you resigned your position, didn't you, at Kirkston? Not really. I think I come up and tapped the sort situation up there first. Aye, but you never saw me no. at the time. You just went up, didn't you? Did I? Because the, the first... I know I said to you... He was scrapping around it, muck it's you and Paul and the other two. Uh, and I could, to me, it was a waste of time. Exactly. Yeah. Not really know what they were doing. No, no, no. Were that, to do we, we knew nothing. No, that, that was it, you see. Yeah, we knew nothing. You and I you were doing something, but you didn't really... No, I spotted it right away, you see. Right. I could see they were wasting the time right. and, and their effort. Yeah. And I said to Mark, I said, look, I said, we've got to go underground. I yeah. said, that's where it rocks are. Mm. Yeah. Well, Mark didn't know one bit from two. Mm. But luckily we went in and I showed him this pillar that we left before and I said, we want that out of there, there. That's the and one that I took you to. Right. So I said, now then, luckily for me, uh, my me, me brother-in-law, he has Kirkson quite, he's there. So I said to Mark, I says, we'll be able to get powder and detonation stuff off, me, off Nick Fessett there. Eh? Mm -hmm. You know, so I used to fetch it from Kirks and Quarries mm -hmm. at weekend, mm -hmm. and we used to drill and fire at weekend, That's George right. Hughes and, That's and, right. and that, didn't yeah. we? So it was that that set us off underground and onto decent rock. Yeah. And then once we got decent rock, we were making decent slate, you see, and then Mark realised that looking at that rock that was just stormed before, actually his money standing there. Yeah. Um, right, yeah, and absolutely. it's just a matter of, of, of working it down, right. and, and it wasn't long, he learned very fast, <laughs> but he was looking a lot of money. Because yeah. initially you bought that mine for its waste outside. Yeah. You didn't ah, realise what was underground and what potentially it had on you. No. Somebody had to buy it. Ah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. He, as I say, he's a very fast learner, mm. and it wasn't long before he knew exactly what he was looking at. You yeah. know, same as us, that he'd been looking at it all our lives, yeah. It was just a matter of, of, of taking them through the process. I want to take you back 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. Their light source on the ground, these massive, these caverns that they've created, most of them done with candle light. And it was the tallow candle. That was the fat from the butchered beef stock that they had was made into a candle, nothing was wasted, and the clay that you see here was actually taken off the land at the bottom of Sea Tower in bucket loads, brought up on horse and trap, and it was distributed through the mine. And the clay was actually pushed against the rock face just so that that candle could burn and it could read the rock face. Now it's a very humbling effect to me in the form that these men would read the rock and all they could see is what was in the glow around the candle. Not what was above their head, just about to fall in on them. Now, in modern day, we've got the fantastic halogen lights. We've got the cherry pickers that you've seen us working on. 
They had the candle and their own wit and wisdom to carry them on. But as you know, I've got a son here, nine years old. And I want to take you back 100, 200, 300 years. This is a 500 year old mine, and the monks from Furness Abbey started it up. But boys like this, and there's people working in China to this day, of his age and younger, working, slaving away. But let's just focus in this mine at the moment. This boy is going to spend for the next 10, 12 hours holding a bar called a juniper like this and he's going to hold it against the rock face and turn it constantly as his father or his workmate would, as his workmate would hit it. Are you ready, friend? Just before we start, take a focus on the original goggles that we wear. I didn't have some eye protection because without eyes, under candlelight, we've got nothing. A gauze wire mesh to stop the flints of the storm from splashing back at them and going straight into their eyes. Now we have bits of metal and bits of stone flashing back into our flesh, even today, and we need stronger garments to actually protect us from that. I've actually got a man in hospital today getting a piece of metal out of his leg. So it still happens. They didn't have doctors and nurses then, so it had to be all home health. You ready? So he's got to not just aimlessly have this up here or conveniently where it rests with his hand. He has to hold it there and hold it. And then he's got to witness turning and keeping it on the dot on the spot. And probably. And as you can see, slowly, and if we do that for the next 8 to 10, 12 hours, we'll have a 3 foot, 4 foot hole buried into that rock face. And the next part that I'm going to show you, well you just won't believe. This, if it's incorrectly done, can kill somebody in a second. Equally, if it's done correctly, everybody exits the mine safely. And what you need is a piece of straw like this, and you pick the longest length, or the kids are trained to pick the longest length between each knuckle, because the knuckle, the growth knuckle, actually blocks the tube off. So we've got one there now, and the knuckle's there, so I'm just going to cut it off, and prepare it. I'm going to prepare that ready for blasting. What the tradesman did is actually pour gunpowder down the whole of the barley to one end, fill that full of gunpowder, and then we'll just try and start filling that up now. Can you hold on there? Out of our uh, gunpowder, this is an original gunpowder case. We now need to fill with the small pieces. Put your finger on the end there like that. We need to fill, which is an art in itself, it up with gunpowder. This was a timely exercise that would be done whether we're having a cup of tea in the bait room. But it wasn't a bait room. It was standing in a cold, damp place like this. And the quicker they got this rock down, the, could, the quicker that they could actually make it into roofing slates. Because until 
the actual rock was on the ground and to start producing the roofing slate is only when they got paid when it was put over the Weybridge down at the halls. So as they actually filled this up, they were contemplating the last eight to ten hours of the drill that that rock was going to blast how they designed it to blast. And if it didn't, it would create an awful amount of work to put another hole in after the charge had gone wrong. I know this because in the last ten years, me and my brother and all the workers that have been here, we've had good blasts and we've had blasts that have gone terribly wrong. It's taken us six months to clear it out of the way. So it's very humbling for me to talk as I am with you now about the whole process of mining. It's just truly, truly unbelievable. Now fill the straw up full of gunpowder. The next step is to, can you hold that there? Is to now put the starter fuse. This was incredibly difficult because if you actually look lit the end of that fuse now, instantaneously that would get to the charge and it would blow up. So they had to have a delay fuse. And what they used to use is a form of card. It was actually laced with fat, possibly from the, the fat of the tallow candle again. And when they actually, the more spinning that you do on the card, the longer the fuse burns. Understand me, folks, there's very little, very little for the um, air to get to. And the fat just kept it burning. Now then, that is then introduced into the straw, like so. We now have the fuse ready. This is now going to be inserted into the hole that we've drilled and then, believe it or not, they use a 14 foot stick with a candle tied to the end of it to light the very end of this. If they miss the end of the cardboard and cut it short, which happened, the gunpowder got to it first and it would, be instant, it would be an instantaneous blast. Can you imagine trying to eye up 14 feet away in complete darkness with a few candles dotted around to give you the depth perception to actually hit the end of that? Very timely there were some very experienced people that actually lasted a long time on the ground to become skilled at it. Some didn't last very long at all. So the men would strategically place candles down to the exit for protection where they had to run to after they had the fuse lit. Now as a very experienced man that could actually light one, how about two fuses? Occasionally they did two holes with two fuses. So when one was lit, they were getting rather impatient to light the second one before they could actually exit the mine to the point of safety. It's when you're underground firing, uh, there's always an element of risk, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, in old days before we used Cortex, which is a exploding fuse anyway, we were on all blue fuse. And many a time we, we, we used to have three holes up in the roof, you know, big double ladders, gantry on, and drilling up into the roof and charging it up and a big long blue safety fuse on. And, and, and then another further down, another further down. And when it, it come to fire, we had a candle stuck on the end of a big long stick well, we used to light candle, obviously, and, and up at first end, well, the time you, you got on the end of fuse, it would shh, and you knew that was going. The time you got down to the second one, uh, up, up with candle again, and, and it took you slightly longer to get end of fuse, and it would shh, 
go and Danny got the third one. <laughs> you, you think you're so good for that? Guy. That's guy. That's what's the spin guy from the age. And of course, you get there a candle, me it feels <laughs> like <it's laughs> it. You can't actually eat fumes because you're thinking of other things. Uh, and when you do finally hit third, then, oh, whoosh, down. you're running like that. And now you just get to the end of the tunnel. <laughs> now then, we're sat on the ground here and the wind's blowing from outside. If the wind direction changes on the ground, then we can have the galleries blow through with lots of wind. Occasionally, the candles will blow out as the wind direction changed and then we're running into complete darkness after the fuse has been lit. You can only imagine the perils and torment that they went through in this procedure. Right, the next step, and get the fuse into the hole, equally as dangerous was using this elongated needle, and it was made of steel. And that was a big, big problem, because steel, if it's hit, it can create an um, ignition to the explosives, which they weren't didn't have the knowledge of it at that time. So, do you want to do this, Prentice? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So what they did is they actually slowly in turn twisted it in and broadened the hole out until they got it into the gunpowder, which I've just done. All the way in. Now then, the reason why that's going to be left like that is that if I actually put that in now, I can't stamp the hole. So the steel stopped the hole being crushed for stemming. This is a stemming bar. Like I explained before, we've got to it, hit it incredibly hard. So now what we do, now that it's been stemmed, we twist that out. And hopefully if we're still holding this needle, and I'm saying a relief, that that hasn't ignited the gunpowder inside. We then replace it with the proper charged fuse. Wow. And there we have it. You seal the end. And that's ready to be lit with a 14 foot stick with a candle stuck to the end of it. And it got to the stage, we got an order in, didn't we, from Boston in Lincolnshire. Ah, Do you we remember? Got, we got that big enough of tip. I will wait a minute. <laughs> so, I'll bet you a tenner, I'll have this lump out of here by tonight. Right? Well, I drove the bloody digger up into there, didn't I? And dragged this bloody <laughs> massive rock out, and by five o'clock, she was there, wasn't she? Down at the bloody, and he says, well, I can't believe what you've done. Well, the next morning, we popped it, didn't we? We put a no, we I put a di finished no, dynamite no. in and we popped the rock. It was the biggest load of crap. Even <laughs> I could recognise that. And I just wasted all my time. Yeah, now we, we, yeah. we took all day the next day and then by about four o'clock coming no, dark again. Yeah. I had an order of ten thousand pounds and I needed stone. Yeah. And then after actually getting this rock out, yeah. John, it was like all of a sudden I remember. There was the one that got away. <laughs> Just like that, wasn't it? Was it? A fair club it was up. pouring, I mean, absolutely <laughs> pissing down outside. Cats and dogs. Yeah. And 
you said it, it just, got to... Just remember, didn't I? You just so remember. I remember when I was bringing this fantastic clog out uh, one day, uh, and she went off the rails, and big lump went right over there and down towards Buttermere. And down. <laughs> now, because because he saw me get this big lump out of road end, he uh, said, if there's anybody that can get that lump <laughs> at every bait time, at every place, for the last 30 years, people uh, have talked about the one that got away. <laughs> so when they'd never been short of rock, uh, they would always blame the person that lost. If, if we had that bait, we could have done that job. Yeah. And you said, well, if there's any man that can do it, I can. You went, said, got it, yeah. <laughs> we okay. went down that night. I we we went, you, you went up there with Liggett in, 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 in waste heap there. That's, that's right. Oh, we have we read the torches? We have. We have. Because I knew it was a fantastic bit of rock because I lost it. <laughs> <laughs>
and you know there's a grave four foot away from you and there's a dead body there I mean it's character building isn't it I would never ever give a job to somebody that I wouldn't do myself and I've done the worst of the worst jobs so it doesn't really uh, count but I would never want to forget about that or if somebody I was talking to somebody and this is not some snotty educated person saying oh yes and he wants to be part of the team and we know all these people go around and say what do you do then I'd rather say I was a grave digger than an entrepreneur and if you look down at the grave digger I've got the highest respect for people that do the graves and whatever them jobs have got to be done but equally it isn't what I wanted to do and, and I wouldn't want to be there but um, in my mind's eye the person the worker you have great respect for the workers because it's what's brought this nation on and now we seem to be forgetting about them, don't we? Mm. Which is unfortunate. I was uh, quite frightened to tell you the truth and for really a couple of years I really He's... wished he hadn't got it. Yeah. I wished he'd gone bankrupt really and yet there was me helping him not to go bankrupt. Yeah. Because what frightened me most of all was winching them clogs up all the dangerous work that he was doing up there, which, you know, was dangerous. Levering out, I remember you telling me levering out mm. uh, bits of uh, loose rock from the roof. And I knew just one false move and you were gone, or somebody was gone. Mm. And because you actually know, I mean, you grew up with, with, with some of them that actually lost the father and the brother up there. Yeah, I do. I went to school with a girl. Edith Jackson, bless her, she's dead now as well, but her father was the last man to die up there. And she grew up, Bill Jackson was his name, and him and his dad were winching up a clog in New Crags opposite. And it slipped out of its chain and it fell on the son, which was Edith's dad. And um, he died two, years, two, two days later in Keswick Hospital through his injuries caused by this clog dropping on him. So I knew how dangerous his job was. And uh, I knew how professional these men were as well. You know, they weren't stupid men, these were clever men. And I thought, I've got to make time to go up there and see what's happening. And I went up one day and you took me around with such pride to see the walls that he'd built up. So I didn't see Honister really at its worst, other than that first day you took me up. Mm. But you didn't see inside then, did you? you no, see... I'd never been in the mountain, no. No, but you didn't even see inside the buildings. I didn't even see inside the buildings, no. But yeah. you were trying to make it all tidy, because you said yeah. this mattered to the National Park. If you wanted to get permission to yeah. carry on there, you needed it to look tidy. Physically, to um, get from one place to the other, I've either got to jump in a helicopter, which is a fantastic thing to do, or get in a Land Rover, or get in a truck, just to get me to the next place. And it's kept me busy, and somebody, uh, I quoted somebody the other day, saying that, you know, you're a very lucky person to be busy, but there's busy and busy. I saw, I caught my brother walking down, down from the mine, and I said, do you want a lift? He says, no, he says, it's all right to work. And I looked on him enviously as he was walking down, down the road. And I thought, wow, you lucky person. You've got the privilege of walking down there and taking it all in. And that's what this video is about. We're giving you a snapshot. And it truly, truly is a privilege to walk. And I feel that there's so many people that can get up in the morning, they have the breakfast, they get in the car, Unfortunately, the people on the M25, I do feel sorry for those, because it isn't a privilege to be in the M25, but you're driving. Get out of your cars, strip off that day-to-day -day drudgery, come up here and have that privilege and walk with me.